Hi all, welcome to Atmospheric Evidence uh, recorded discussion as part of Monash Art Design and Architecture and Monash University Museum of Arts Warp Tones content series. My name is Tim Riley Walsh and I'm joined here today by artist researcher Susan Shukley and anti-disciplinary artist Joel Sherwood Spring. A pleasure to have you both joining us. Um, I'll leave uh, Susan and Joel to personally introduce themselves in just a moment. I will begin by acknowledging uh, the country on which I live and from where I speak to you today, that of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I would like to extend this respect to all First Nations peoples. And I recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. It is my pleasure to host this discussion today uh, as the 2022 Curator in Residence within Monash Art, Science and Architecture, Monash University here in um, Melbourne. And in addition to my work at Monash, I'm also currently the Curator at Gertrude, also in Melbourne. And my research interests are focused on how visual culture comprehends and articulates the threat of climate crisis and the central implication of settler colonialism within it. For access reasons, I will briefly provide a visual description of myself before asking Susan and Joel to do the same. I am a white cis man with slightly long red brown hair, red blonde hair rather, and I'm in my mid thirties. I'm wearing glasses and I'm wearing a bright red knit. I'll now hand over to Susan and then to Joel to provide visual descriptions and a brief more personal introduction to who they are and where they are based. Susan. Great. Thank you so much, Tim, for the opportunity to um, join you and Joel in a conversation. For me, it's obviously the morning. I'm based here in London in the UK, and I'm an artist researcher, and I'm also the director of the Center for Research Architecture at Goldsmiths University of London, and an affiliated researcher with forensic architecture um, which I was involved with in the early days with A.L. Leitzman back in 2018. 11, when we started the agency. Um, my work often engages with sites of conflict and tries to raise questions around um, the role of material evidence in relationship to uh, claims, um, both claims for justice, but also political claims. Um, a brief visual description of myself would be I'm a relatively tall, um, woman with short hair. Um, I'm wearing bright sort of neon orange glasses right now. And I have a backdrop of a uh, 3D um, sort of glacier actually, which is my backdrop image for Zoom. And that will make a little bit more sense as, as this discussion um, unfolds. And also um, I'm both uh, Swiss and Canadian. And my, so my work really has taken me into uh, cryospheric environments most recently, that is to say the frozen geographies of our planet. Fantastic. Thanks, Susan. Um, Joel, could I hand over to you? Of course, thank you, um, Tim, and thank you so much, Susan. Um, I'm streaming to you from the unceded lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, who have practiced their sovereignty and law on this land, commonly known as Sydney, um, since the first sunrise. Um, I want to acknowledge their endless and continuous care for country. This is the place that I was born um, and I still call home. Um, and in doing so, I want to pay my respects to the Gadigal people, their ancestors in their struggles through frontier wars and their elders, present and future. Um, it is upon their lands that I undertake my work as a designer and a researcher. Um, and these are stolen lands for which uh, treaty uh, nor sovereign agreement has ever been negotiated. Um, my name is Joel Sherwood Spring. Um, I am a Wiradjuri um, anti-disciplinary artist. Um, I generally work pretty collaboratively on projects that I would say maybe sit outside the kind of established notions of contemporary art and architecture, um, attempting to kind of think about and kind of trans 
through discourse and pedagogies and um, artwork and design and kind of uh, in the past of a more formal architectural practice and sort of currently and sort of continually kind of focusing on the and examining the kind of contested narratives of Australia's urban culture and Indigenous history in the face of ongoing colonization. Um, I am a uh, white skinned uh, man um, in his late twenties. I'm wearing a pair of silver rimmed glasses um, and headphones. I'm wearing a navy blue uh, parka. Uh, and behind me, my background image is similarly to what Susan said may make more sense in the future in the later half of this chat, but who actually knows. Um, but it's a sort of a collage of a set of um, scans of, of smoke clouds that I've been taking. Um, as a part of a kind of ongoing project of documentation of some of the work I've been making, which, um, yeah, I'll probably go into a little more in this discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Joel. And thank you, Susan. Um, to provide, provide some framing for uh, today's discussion, I thought that I would just begin um, shortly, just for you know, five minutes, to talk a little bit about One Vast Library, which is the project um, that Susan and Joel's work is shown within. Um, and once I've done that, I'll sort of pass back to Susan and then to Joel to talk individually about their work and their research and its intersections with this idea of atmospheric evidence. Um, and then we'll open it up to a bit of a wider discussion at the end, which will go for about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, this semester of form time content is worth mentioning is strict structured around the theme of on care. Um, today's talk will consider care to an extent by a, a maybe a deeper attunement to the atmosphere and also a sense of justice uh, towards the planet and maybe ask whether art could assist in this process. And we'll think about art as a form of evidence perhaps and the possibility of it bringing about, um, as I said, some justice for the planet. One Vast Library is a series of three exhibitions. One's taken place um, so far. The second will be opening uh, very so shortly um, as well as an accompanying events and publications and this was presented across 2022 at Marta Gallery. Um, the project's title is drawn really from the writings of uh, the 19th century English mathematician and early innovator of machine computing. Uh, his name was Charles Babbage, and he described the atmosphere as a shared repository of human experience. And I quote from Babbage when he says, one vast library on whose pages are forever written all that man has ever said, end quote. So this idea of the air as an increasingly dense accumulation of human voice and breath, and of course, the fume of anthropogenic emission really frames this program. And obviously within this notion, I would like to acknowledge the significant knowledge and law held within Sky Country for First Nations peoples on this continent. Babbage was undoubtedly millennia late to the recognition of the sky as a rich resource of learning about the processes of the world and its environments. And this is a space in which culturally specific knowledge is deeply embedded and must be importantly protected and cultivated. One Vast Library aims to articulate really a changing relationship with the atmosphere in the context of climate crisis. And it's the hope, at least for me, is that this demonstrates a fluctuating representation across late 20th and early 21st century Australian and international art. As we might hear today, this is what Susan describes in her recent book, material witness as a form of proxy data, non-scientific materials that may act to reveal new understandings of complex events, such as global warming. So this process really began with the first show, Diachronic Wind, uh, which was presented earlier this year. And in this show, I was reading a little bit of the work of Andreas Malm and his book, Fossil Capital, where Malm described the messy mix up of time scales at the heart of anthropogenic emission how violence across, uh, against the planet can really be extended in its temporality, dispersed and lagged, and also stubbornly non-visual. And of course, when we think about these ideas, one should really reflect on the writings of Rob Nixon and his term, slow violence. This discussion today and the second exhibition in Permanent Shelter that accompanies it, which Susan and Joel's work is within, is grounded in these contexts and also specifically starts to unravel one of the quieter threads in this program, which is that the, this, the how air and atmosphere is kind of repeatedly implicated in the work of dematerialized practices in the mid 20th century. You have to think of artists like Robert Barry or Art and Language, Michael Asher, to name a few. And this show though specifically really looks to one figure, Eve Klein, 
the French artist, um, a proto-conceptualist, and um, a figure that really preceded this kind of uh, later kind of conceptual work. In 40, 1946, Klein, of course, symbolically signed the sky, a gesture that I feel speaks deeply of a really curious um, and telling hierarchy of man's ownership over a, such a vast and complex system. Klein's pursuit of the immaterial led him to work with architects Werner Ranau and Claude Perrant on conceiving his air architecture from 1957 to the year of his death in 1962. And Klein's proposal suggested the creation of, I quote, a new Eden where the solid materiality of architecture is done away with and is now immaterial ceilings made of pressurized air, walls of fire, and humanity's only pursuit as leisure. I find it really curious um, that Klein's vision of utopic, utopic society from his position in the mid-century consisted of the very elements of air and fire that, sat, that society is now beset by, an atmosphere really grown dangerously agitated by carbon dioxide emissions and an environment where devastating bush and forest fires are growing in frequency and scale. And of course, within so-called Australia, a place where the dominance of settler colonialism and its ingrained structure of Torrens Tidal, property demarcation, and occupation of unceded lands is far from immaterial. In fact, in many senses, violently physical. The second show's title, The Impermanent Shelter, intends to try and encapsulate these positions, acknowledging perhaps to the now impermanence of the shelter that the planet has offered us to date, brought about by human interference. Both Susan and Joel's work is exhibited within the show and will be touched on today in this discussion and really elucidate these kind of points a little bit further. But of course, our conversation will diverge to look at other projects of theirs that are relevant as well. Um, and I'd now like to actually throw over to Susan to introduce us to her work in more detail and share us with some further share us with us some further reflections before I hand over to Joel. Susan. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, maybe I'll just begin by a reflection on, I was just thinking about um, the project, this project of air architecture by Klein. And in some way that is a provocation that captures a lot of what's at stake in the work that we do in the center, which is largely a center um, in which students focus on investigations of violations. Um, oftentimes those are environmental violations, but also of course, human rights violations, but the one thing that we're always engaging with is that are these threshold conditions, you know, and whether that is the distinction between aquatic or terrestrial space, but also um, within the realm of conflict, um, we always look at the ways in which environmental factors are contributing or exacerbating factors to say something that might appear like a military conflict or an ethnic conflict. Uh, for example, the war in Syria, um, the ways in which long-term uh, drought uh, produced a lot of internal dispossession and displacement of, of people into like urban spaces um, from more say rural communities. So um, that's just to say that this sort of more diffuse and if you will, sometimes what, we, what we'd say are sort of threshold conditions where it's, we can't really demarcate clearly between the beginning of an event and an actual kind of incident, I think that's somehow captured nicely by uh, the provocation of Klein to really, we really need to be thinking when it comes to, um, when it comes to these kinds of environmental infractions and particularly it's impossible to be thinking about, it's, to be thinking in terms of kind of discrete objects. We're always talking about relational kind of prod, um, processes. And that certainly would be the ways in which First Nations communities would also understand and experience relationships of land. So I think the notion of something that is a much more of a, a kind of threshold condition that has a certain kind of elasticity or permeability or expands and contracts is very important conceptually to the ways in which um, I've been thinking in the work that we do in the center more broadly. Um, to answer your question very um, precisely, my work as an artist really begins within the context of public art. And that's when I was based in Vancouver, uh, which I was for many years now. I'm of course in the UK, but in working on public art, 
projects, that was really where I encountered architecture because at the time I was working on projects that were really trying to contest the sort of official narratives of the city and bring in, uh, in particular, women's experiences of, 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 of the city and also um, histories of um, histories of sexual violence, but also kind of colonial violence, the ways in which the official narratives of the urban um, scripted uh, very particular, highly mythologized um, histories for in a city like Vancouver. And my public artworks really try to counter those official kind of narratives and to speak much more to kind of localized and situated experiences. And um, so it was that in doing that work that I really encountered as I actually, as a demand, I needed to find a, a set of um, critical tools with which to think. And for me, um, the writing and art wasn't really doing that. And so I turned to uh, work that was emerging in spatial theory and architecture in particular sort of feminist thinking. And that, so that I would say was really my first encounter with architecture. Of course, working in the public realm, I was often dealing with site plans, engineers, um, you know, you're dealing with the infrastructure of the city. So that, you know, that convergence between say art and architecture happened at that moment in Vancouver where I was um, a young artist developing these public art projects. You asked me to um, speak briefly in, to the material witness book. Um, that comes much, much further along in my practice at, um, it, it emerged out of my PhD. That's really where I was developing the concept of the material witness, which is really trying to look at the ways in which matter registers events, um, but also provides insight into the uh, event of evidence making. And so the book will look at who and what is considered a legitimate um, subject able to confer, or who, you know, who or what can speak on behalf of their experiences. Um, this really comes to a fore within the context of um, climate change, as far as I'm concerned, because up until very recently in the Canadian context, uh, environmental scientists largely completely ignored uh, First Nations knowledge or Indigenous knowledge of long-term climate observations. So there's, you know, there's a very um, obvious example of the ways in which only certain subjects are endowed with the legitimacy to speak on behalf of their condition within particular kinds of forums like the IPCC, for example. Mm. So the book really tracks materials and the contestations that emerge around materials and the and this various stakeholders that also um, gather around these contested materials. It largely focused on um, situations of international law. So it you know, its framing might be considered critical legal studies. Um, so I look at a range of case studies and the, but the book begins much more, I'd say within sort of, uh, or grapples with more conventional notions of media and really begins with a piece of film that was shot um, during the time of Chernobyl in which radioactive um, isotopes had radically transformed the celluloid film stock. And the filmmaker thought that his film was defective, but finally realized that what he had captured on film was the sound, um, the sound and sort of visual imprint, if you will, of the disaster itself. So that was an important moment for me where the, the event had registered within the filmic matter. So we're no longer in the domain of representation. It was the were the, the, the domain of the actual, if you will, or the real. Um, by the end of the book, I really um, start to expand considerably my notion of what constitutes a kind of mediatic system and look at sort of um, what I call, or try to propose this notion of earth evidence and really look at the ways in which the planet itself is a sort of geomediological kind of entity completely encrusted with um, technologies of capture, recording, sensing, transmission, et cetera. Um, so, you know, it was a long, um, it was a slow burn or a long simmer, one might say, this project of material witness. It will stay with me, presumably, um, <laughs> you know, 
across the trajectory of, of uh, uh, future projects as well, because there's always this engagement with materials. And I try really to understand them within highly kind of localized um, uh, situations. And uh, that, of course, you know, eventually brought me to um, the atmospheric feedback loop, which was a commissioned 35 millimeter film, uh, which subsequently has sh been shown much more as a digital version, but it was it is actually originally a 35 millimeter film. And that was a commission from Sonic Axe, which is based in the Netherlands. And I had been a participant on their dark ecology field trip where we um, started in Kirkenes in, in, at the very tip of Norway and then um, entered into um, Russia, which at that time was also this passage where a lot of Syrian refugees were moving uh, from Russia into Europe via this uh, border um, border post in uh, Kirkenes. And the, like infamously at the time, there were these huge heaps of bicycles in the snow because there was this strange uh, legal condition that nobody could cross the border on foot. So these bicycles were being, uh, you know, like people were had to ride these bicycles through the snowstorm. It was very bizarre, um, both just visual encounter, but also legal condition. And it reminds us of the ways in which legal forms with all of their arcane protocols and rules of procedures really are significantly challenged when it comes to uh, producing uh, accountability, let alone any form of kind of justice. And time and time again, we encounter the kind of um, incapacity of legal mechanisms to really attend to wrongs and to produce any kind of uh, any semblance of justice. But that field trip took us into uh, nor into Russia, to Murmansk, to Nikol, to these uh, incredibly polluted uh, geographies in that part of Russia. Uh, you know, deeply, deeply um, impoverished. Uh, Nikol as a town is just the landscape is just black, the sort of coal dust that is everywhere. So, uh, and the trip itself was called Dark Ecologies because it was also the time of the year, it was December, where there was no, uh, it was like 24 hours of sort of darkness. So um, the atmospheric feedback loops emerged out of that encounter with Sonic X. And Sonic X, um, by its name, suggests it is actually an acoustic, uh, um, uh, if it, it has a long history of producing sound festivals, music and sound. Um, and so I thought that it would be interesting to try and um, work with climate scientists, but through the register of the acoustic. And I was able to work with a group of scientists who are based at, the, at Cabao, the Cabao, the Cabao, um, the Cabao Experimental Site for Atmospheric Research. Um, and I'll play a little clip of that um, shortly, but just to say that um, they have a lot of acoustic instrumentation that they use to measure and monitor the atmosphere. And I thought this is really where myself as an artist, very interested in acoustics could meet the climate scientists. And we certainly shared the same language because they would talk about clouds and, at, you know, and, and atmospheric noise. They talked about the signal to noise ratio and the ways in which they had to extract the signal from the cloud. So, and so a lot of the, um, I realized, wow, the, we're working with similar kinds of technologies, uh, both, you know, they're working from the infrasound, you know, from the realm of infrasound up. Um, and also the, the language that was being used was the same sort of language that I would use, but obviously for very different kinds of um, purposes. So I've often seen my work, uh, just to wrap up, I've often seen my work in some way as um, as trying to mediate different realms of knowledge production, different realms of expertise. So the abstractions of law would be a case in point that I really tried to mediate and write about in the Material Witness book, where the work that I've been doing um, 
in relationship to ecological issues, oftentimes engages with uh, techno, techno scientific realms of expertise. And so I've really tried to see my role as a kind of mediator and also the materials with which I work also as mediators between different, um, um, different realms of abstraction. And we, of course, we'd have to include art in that as well. Um, and so that's the role that I've tried to play. And then I didn't know if you wanted me to talk about the uh, cold cases. I could say a couple of words about that. Um, I've been embarked, I've worked on a very long term research project called Learning from Ice. I was just talking about how I see my role as a mediator, but within that project, ice is really the mediator. Um, and working with scientists, with glaciologists, but also working with sort of mountain communities in the case in the work that we were doing in India, um, ice being a very um, kind of very actually ordinary material. Most people have some experience of <laughs> and contact with ice. So there's something I really like working with materials that are quotidian. Um, even though I have to, I've done quite a bit of work around nuclear evidence, but that's another story. Um, but in doing this work in this research project, Learning from Ice, out of which some artworks have emerged, lots of different workshops, and but of course field work. So it's not all about generating art by any means. Um, one of the things that I felt I really wanted to, to do was actually produce a body of work that engaged directly with the politics of temperature, um, which you know, the politics of temperature, of course, is central to the climate crisis, but in working within the cryospheric uh, context, that is to say within cold environments, um, one of the things I felt I needed to do was address very directly the ways in which cold is also artificially produced, an ambient condition that can be weaponized and utilized against bodies. And the cases that I worked on were largely uh, cases of cold being used as a tacit instrument of policing and abuse against uh, racialized bodies, First Nations bodies within the case of Canada and uh, Standing Rock, but also um, in the context of icebox detention at the US-Mexico border. Um, and I think this is quite important and links up with your project, Tim, because we're really talking about ambient conditions. So temperature is an ambient condition. It is a spectrum condition. People don't experience the same uh, temperature. People experience temperature different, differently. Uh, no two people will have exactly the same experience of temperature because it's your experience of temperature is, has a lot to do with your, um, your health, uh, you know, your, your body fat, the amount of body fat, the kind of clothing that you have, uh, your gender, all kinds of factors come into play. And so the experience of temperature is always one of difference. And it's this differential experience of temperature. Um, to me, that differential experience is, is the sort of way it is the space in which is the space of violence, if you will. Um, so the the guards and the detention centers in Mexico are wearing the right kind of clothing. The skiers in the Alps that are engaged in leisure activities are wearing the right kind of clothing. They have the skills to uh, deal with these cold mountain environments or the artificial cold of the detention center along the US-Mexico border. So we see the ways in which these differential um, experiences of an ambient condition can produce real harm. And I think that's also the challenge, of course, ambient events, atmospheric events are often seen as beyond the purview and control of humans. And that's the ways in which uh, the legal response has been, that's the, that's the legal response to these conditions of cold. When uh, police and authorities are confronted with the consequences of freezing deaths in Canada, the answer would always be, um, well, we didn't realize it was gonna get that cold. We have no control over the weather. The same at Standing Rock. You know, We had no idea that the temperatures would dip below zero. Uh, we don't control the weather. So how can we be responsible for the harm that ensues? 
And so we really see the ways in which these sort of ambient events and atmospheric events produce this very um, kind of useful alibi in terms of regimes of accountability. And so my work with the cold cases was really to counter that, uh, that condition and to look at a kind of pattern of abuse that emerges over many, many decades and over many contexts, including the context in which I live now where migrants are perishing and dying of hypothermia in the European context when trying to cross between from Italy into France across the Alps or in between Turkey and Greece through these um, river deltas. Um, so that gives you a little bit of um, a context for the, the work that I've done and, and where I am at now with my research projects. Thank you, Susan. Um, lots for us to um, unpack there, especially I think um, a discussion perhaps uh, near the end about this kind of you phrase it as the useful alibi of um, humanity's uh, sort of sense of um, atmosphere as being beyond the purview of um, human control and its weaponization, which I think is a very telling and uh, poignant um, reflection. Um, but before we kind of discuss um, and open that up a bit more, I'd like to pass over to Joel to just introduce a little bit more about his practice. Joel. Uh, thank you, Tim. And again, thank you so much, Susan. I, there's um, so much resonance between um, a lot of the things you've mentioned and probably where I'm going to take this <laughs> um, discussion as well. Um, first, I'd, I'd wish to sort of frame my practice. Um, in relationship to this and sort of participating this within a larger framework. You know, I'm sort of negotiating and learning how to employ art making and exhibitionary practices and publication and, and discourse and the teaching that I do within what is like largely recognized in the international academic space as like black or indigenous studies. Um, and for me, it's sort of in the efforts of exploring the potential of um, an indigenous uh, and, and, and situated um, sovereignty specific. So maybe thinking about it through my own subjectivity as a Wiradjuri person living in, in Gadigal country, but what an indigenous materialist reading of art and architecture um, creates, um, kind of directed towards um, the efforts of uh, repatriation, reparations and land back. Uh, so so that's, that, that's a way of framing what I do. Um, maybe not what I've done um, so much as I what I'm sort of interested in, in pursuing. I'm currently engaged um, and commencing a PhD at the University of Technology here in Sydney, um, where I'm working with um, both architecture and legal scholars um, to look at um, how we talk about uh, materials um, within the context of extraction in the Australian kind of context, but more globally, how uh, buildings themselves come into being um, and sort of a, a focal point of that project which I think touches on a lot of the points you just made Susan um, is questioning these ambient conditions um, through which uh, power is enacted um, but also the histories of violence that have enabled um, what could be seen maybe less so in the context of weather or climatic conditions as ambient but the sort of structural uh, legal space um, with a particular attention at the moment being paid to what we call in Australia heritage protection as a sort of banal um, set of rules that we um, use to kind of maintain something as simple as a sort of uh, it's a you know it's a, it's a lens through which you would um, look at a council submission for a renovation of a house, um, as well as the, the kind of criteria through which you would look at uh, the redevelopment of, uh, of a city block or the maintenance of a um, heritage. Um, when, and, and when I use the word heritage, we're talking about a very particular type of heritage when it comes to the built environment um, in the Australian context, which is um, rarely older than 200 years, right? Um, and, and thinking about that in relation, so that since so the, the the necessary historical violences that bring those banal conditions, the kind of ambient um, kind of conditions through which architecture practices, um, but also the kind of existing continual continued violence that those ambient conditions have, particularly 
on Indigenous bodies, um, particularly on the climate. Um, and so that has kind of brought me first into contact uh, with kind of particular um, focus on the Hyde Park Barracks. So um, the sort of Hyde Park Barracks was built um, in like 1816, 1819 area, um, pretty early in the kind of contact narrative of um, Southeast Australia. Um, it was commissioned by Governor Macquarie um, in, a, in its own interesting capacity. But uh, what I'm particularly interested in is um, the sort of narratives in relationship to how very much the, the heritage buildings that still stand today within um, the New South Wales and the Southeast context are um, masonry structures um, built from quarried sandstone from the surrounding areas um, by um, the labor of um, convicted uh, convicts um, and brought into being um, through uh, limestone mortar or quicklime mortar. Um, but there was no limestone in New South Wales um, for the first, uh, there, there was a kind of an understanding that there would be, um, or at least an assumption, there would be easily accessible uh, limestone from a kind of colonial perspective um, to be quarried and to be um, manipulated. Uh, but there was there was none um, for, and there was no, no kind of deep resources that were able to be uh, mined and sort of um, taken for a, a good 30 to 40 years. But what was um, available uh, was a vast network of uh, middens or uh, large scale shell structures um, that were built up over um, tens of thousands of years um, by the local indigenous people of the Eora nations, the Gadigal mob, but also Bidjigal and sort of all up the eastern seaboard. Um, there is sort of a kind of long history of the sort of um, sustained um, building of this uh, kind of architectural scale um, urbanism of networks um, built up of shell matter um, and shells are made up of calcium, right? And so, shell, so the shells themselves were um, burnt um, to harness the, the, the lime or the um, calcium oxide that was in them. Um, and then that, those, those burnt remains, those midden piles that were burnt and, and thus the trees that had to be cut down to burn to that, to that midden um, to, to get the lime, that's what created the sort of lime mortar that built up um, these heritage buildings themselves. And so I'm sort of interested at looking at sort of these necessary histories of violence, um, but in talking about these ambient conditions, I think what's quite interesting um, or what has become the sort of impulse is, yeah, this, this this need um, to address these things in relationship to contemporary injustices. Um, and so the sort of framework through which um, the Heritage Protection Act work for heritage buildings. And I mean, I kind of skipped this bit in what I just said, but the, a lot of our heritage buildings in New South Wales and particularly in Australian context are uh, carceral. <laughs> um, this was a penal colony. Um, and so um, the buildings that sustain some of them still operate in this way. So there are still heritage listed prisons in New South Wales. Prisons that um, house um, all sorts of um, populations, but um, as we understand statistically in this country, um, we over incarcerate Indigenous people. Um, and so these sort of, sort of violences of these structures play out against Indigenous bodies to the point at which um, there are, there are kind of ambient claims made by corrections and, um, and by the justice system um, made against um, people or families um, taking you know, coroners or, or, or the justice system to court about deaths in custody. So when Indigenous people die, um, locked up. Um, and, and the defense is being made in many, in many um, examples I've kind of been finding um, within a certain context. And I won't go into any detail on any specific one. But um, often it is within the sort of um, the framework of um, systemic neglect that um, can create the conditions for um, deaths in custody within the, um, the, the kind of justice system and within incarceration. Um, there are many contexts by which um, Indigenous people or, or people um, have hurt themselves um, within their cells. Um, and this is kind of graphic, um, because of an inadequate um, 
care taken to the potential uh, hanging points or points within a cell that someone could manipulate to um, commit suicide or, 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 or do something. Um, and often the claim that is made by justice or by corrections when these claims are brought forward is that these, these buildings are a heritage, so they can't, they can't actually change that. Right, so here a very like a very clear um, kind of a very basic banal kind of ambient condition of what it means to practice architecture um, is used as kind of in how you explain the way that kind of ambient temperature itself is also sort of um, used as a way of culpability it is sort of laid up as the as the as the reason for inaction. Um, the Royal Commission into Death in Custody that was um, kind of initiated in, in the 1980s. Um, explicitly lists um, as a recommendation the removal of hanging points from cells you know and so um, it is it is uh, something that the legal system can point to but it's also something um, within the heritage framework that the um, justice and um, kind of policing can point to as a something they cannot change right and so looking at the kind of the, the the real violences in which these kind of powers come into play um, is sort of something that I think really resonated with what you just mentioned and maybe isn't particularly um, connected to um, this exhibition right now, but it is sort of the ongoing thread in which they sort of engage with the sort of material research and material sort of inquiries of my own practice um, and, to, and to sort of speak more fully to um, maybe the sort of research. I mean, on the back of that, the sort of research around an existing work is what I am presenting um, at the Monash so. so um, I was commissioned by the National Gallery of Australia um, for the latest, um, the, which is still open, the latest um, fourth Indigenous um, art triennial um, called Ceremony, um, which was curated by um, Hedy Perkins. Uh, I have um, a set of works in that show, um, which was sort of a, a kind of outcome of a process um, by which I was um, working and connecting with um, communities um, who had experienced you know, like large scale devastation after the 2019-2020 um, bushfires. Um, in the beginning of 2020, I went down to um, a, a place called Rosedale, which is a coastal town situated on Inuan country, um, south of Sydney, um, where uh, about 50% of the housing stock was lost. Um, and, and, and this is a kind of common um, condition between lots of communities across the sort of eastern seaboard um, in amongst those bushfires. Not that I mean I'm I'm going to get to the the other factors, but sort of housed within my own context as a working within the architecture faculty, we went down to talk to residents and to I saw it as an opportunity to um, investigate what we all sort of understood would be the condition, which is that these houses were these these communities were built at a time where there were different regulations to fire safety and the ensuing uh, regulations or the existing regulations was gonna see those communities built back in a very different way. And what that was gonna do was gonna have a very detrimental effect on any sort of ecological, um, well, it was gonna vast, it was gonna kind of de destroy any chances of any sort of ecological system um, coming back into any sort of, um, not that there's balance, right? But that there, there, there would be something to return to um, and also for me was a kind of advantageous opportunity to sort of try and engage with um, existing local community members around how in this moment they could maybe stake a claim in relationship to um, this land and what that might mean um, in the context of, of, of this devastation. And so it became very quickly about how we talked about the relationships to um, that land, that property, be it private property um, that was lost by um, landowners, you know, predominantly white people living in other places, like these are holiday homes, um, and 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 how kind of that friction came up against the sort of you know continued and denied claims um, of local and indigenous councils and, and, and indigenous groups in those areas. Um, but also as an opportunity to highlight that, you know, these fires were 200 years, 250 years in the making, kind of systemic neglect um, that brings these kind of conditions into being, private property and those sorts of relationships, but also a, an ongoing um, relationship to what would be understood as an unhealthy country. Um, you know, even growth conditions are what crave the sort of leaf litter 
that um, let these fires happen. Um, and obviously with the work of people like Bruce Pascal and Bill, Gav Bill, um, Bill Gamage, um, the greatest estate on earth, we can like, and, and, and kind of continual practice um, evident to this day from indigenous um, communities across this continent. Um, there was never a separation. There was always continual care. Um, and it was this kind of, this condition um, or this nostalgia for an unhealthy place that unfortunately the people who were in power to make decisions about these places, the property owners, the councils had, um, was coming into direct conflict with kind of historical and, and, and contemporary claims made by indigenous people that there needed to be active engagement with this place and active care and burning as um, active sort of cool burning and burning seasonally to um, ensure that there was a kind of healthy balance if you want to if you want to name it that um, in in this context and so quickly became uh, investigation and in how to talk about these relationships um, in a context in which and maybe I can share screen um, in a context in which um, there was only, I guess, what we would call a sense of uh, absence. Um, right. As you can sort of, you know, this is the this is the context of a few like a month or two after the bushfires, um, up and around Rosedale, um, as as across like most of kind of UN country in that area, Mogo Land Council region, so just south of Batemans Bay, um, and the sort of how we could talk about um, memory and connection to these places and, and particular claims that needed to be made um, in wake of this kind of cataclysmic event or this, this kind of devastating moment and, and what was really kind of a sense of like loss and absence, right? And sort of attenuating to um, this sort of sense of, yeah, loss and how we could talk constructively about the things that um, community members, um, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, uh, felt to these places um, and quite quickly became, I mean, for me, um, the most clear, um, and I think you speak quite well on this, um, Susan, this sort of, was sort of inundated with the images, right, the aesthetics of, of these events, um, almost to the point of like desensitized, being desensitized to them. Um, and what was kind of the most impactful kind of moment for me in relationship to this was looking and sort of that deep sense of silence um, and the literal absence of sound um, when in these burnt environments. And so sort of we started a sort of investigation in sort of field recording and looking at the sort of conditions um, of burnt and kind of similarly um, unburnt country um, kind of a couple, you know, 10, 10, 10 kilometers north from there and sort of making a comparative claim about like sort of the sum of that ecosystem sort of sits um, within that sound um, as much as sort of within the visual kind of aspect of, of what was lost and sort of talking um, with community members around their, their sense of loss in relationship to the soundscape of, of the place that they were living in which is, you know, something that bleeds through property boundaries, something that bleeds through um, claims and kind of moves as, you know, ecosystems tend to do as, as birds and, and, other, and other creatures move through systems, um, move through property boundaries. Um, there's a sort of sense of shared um, access to, to the sound of a place. Um, and so it became a sort of investigation into, into talking about that and thinking, of, thinking constructively um, about that sort of material and kind of, more sort of forensic um, approaches of sort of looking at these um, graphical representations of the sound. These are spectrograms, which you know, are a graphical representation of frequency. This is like an aesthetic kind of forensic way of, of, of making a claim um, about these things that um, is also incredibly important when you're talking to groups of people. Um, it's much harder to get them to listen to a thing, um, it's easier to make these claims when you have a visual representation. Um, and sort of thinking about these kind of relationships and engaging in sort of field work to look at these um, and, and thinking about what processes could be enacted uh, with communities to begin to um, make these steps towards caring for country and what that might look like, um, which kind of culminated in this project um, at the kind of 
commission ends with the NGA. So after working with community members um, and kind of locating with a, a few um, different communities um, on you and country, um, talking to them about the very necessary steps that they would need to take to begin to kind of care for country and um, reintroduce kind of traditional fire management was something that was quite antagonistic to the sort of, um, yeah, the, the, the very understandable relationships that the property owners had to these places, which was to, um, you know, a, in, indigenous fire practitioners wanted to cut down trees, they wanted to clear um, parts of land so they could allow for um, regrowth, which was quite antagonistic to, um, you know, people who had existed in a place where they'd only ever known a place to be even growth and kind of un unhealthy. And so how could we like enact a sort of process where my commission, my commissioning of a project could uh, facilitate um, a necessary um, clearing of trees on country to allow for a process of burning to take place, um, kind of culminated in um, us kind of finding room, using my materials budget to sort of facilitate um, the removal of um, the limbs of these trees um, or trees themselves from place, um, from these burnt country and from potential clearing sites and then bring them into um, the sort of framework of this project um, as a sort of material um, and as something that would be sort of um, rendered um, into the into the work themselves, and then sort of in this framework, then um, what could be learnt in the process of burning, um, and that's where the sort of project um, kind of comes to a fore. Here they are installed, um, but sort of the, the the limbs of the trees are burnt out of these masses um, to sort of contemplate and to sort of begin to talk about this sense of absence and sort of material um, relief of these things. I think I'm going on a little bit too long, but sort of the projects of the, the, the video themselves that will be in the installation um, at Monash is a sort of ongoing um, kind of documentation projects of the making of these, as well as other um, kind of field work that I had kind of participated in. Um, down on, on country through sort of participating myself in sort of learning about traditional burning, but also the making of these sculptures in which I sort of was using uh, LIDAR scanners and other project, other other processes to try and capture um, the smoke of these um, burning moments. Because I guess within that transfer of that shift from, you know, presence to absence that is sort of felt or made clear in the sort of visual representation is this transfer, what happens in the fire, right? All of that information becomes something else in, 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 in and this is a, and a massive amount of information in, in terms of smoke and clouds um, as this stuff is kind of burnt away and the, these, these smoke clouds themselves created their own weather conditions, um, storm cells and other things, the smoke cloud could, you know, swept around the earth twice. Um, but that, in, in, in one sense, this atten attenuating to the absence of sound to understand that it is that system that is held within the sound of a place. This was an opportunity. This was an attempt to look at um, where that transfer went to. What what where did that system move into as it was burnt and became a smoke cloud? And sort of trying to capture that, um, it, even at a smaller scale for myself, to sort of think through how we could open up um, a, a discussion around that. And so the sort of project that will be presented is sort of a combination of all of these findings through some still images, uh, as well as sort of video work of um, mixed media sort of archival stuff talking about some of the processes as well as some of my own documentation. Um, thank you, Joel, so much uh, for your uh, response and contributions there and um, a lot to unpack. And I think certainly um, these sort of demands for kind of uh, visual evidence, um, you as you put it, is something that we can maybe use as a segue to talk a little bit more widely about um, the kind of importance of, um, you know, uh, material kind of and visual kind of, uh, you know, images and um, forms of kind of evidence to kind of uh, respond to um, climate crisis and planetary violence. And so I wondered, you know, considering you know, your respective works that you've presented in Impermanent Shelter, uh, thinking of um, Susan's um, atmospheric feedback loops and Joel, your video essay looking at um, the um, outcomes of bushfires and use of LIDAR scans. Um, I wonder if you could both talk a little bit more about what you feel art can offer to um, a process of, of opening up, of um, understanding a little bit more 
um, as Susan puts it in Material Witness, the expressive potential of things uh, as a way to make contact with, and I quote again, the complex realities that constitute our contemporary experiences. I wondered, you know, by looking at historical examples in comparison to present ones, is there a way that we can interrogate violence towards the planet more deeply? How can art facilitate this? Yeah, maybe I'll quickly uh, share screen. And just, I wanted to um, bring, uh, the, just to show this image, um, to start with this, this is actually um, an ice core. And what's extraordinary about ice cores is the fact that they provide a very high resolution data set of um, planetary processes, and, um, but more specifically, everything that goes into the atmosphere is captured in the Earth's um, ice sheets because everything um, that goes into the atmosphere, particulate matter, pollutants, as Joel was talking, smoke, um, eventually everything that goes in the atmosphere will be globally circulated. And, and in talking to various people that model and work on this, it takes about a year in most cases for something that has been thrown into the atmosphere to end up in say the ice sheets of Antarctica or Greenland. Um, here we see um, a layer of ash actually in an ice core and you can see the ways in which um, there's a very clear, um, I mean, here we can see it as, as actually a visual proof. Uh, we see uh, uh, many little um, uh, layers. So it's amazing when you look at ice cores, you can actually do some, uh, you can do some preliminary analysis just based on the sort of, uh, on actually the visual stratigraphy. Um, but this, is, an ice core is obviously, um, it's an extruded piece of ice, a vertical column of ice that's taken out of the, ice sheets, notably, as I said, Antarctica and Greenland. And those are the contexts in which the depth of the ice allows scientists to go back 800,000 years into the ancient climactic past of the, of the planet. Um, but it, ice, to answer your question, Tim, ice cores are considered data proxies. Um, and that is, proxies are in the world of climate science, in the world of earth science, are entities that allow us to have some access and, in, and information about climactic histories, about conditions of precipitation, et cetera, long before the invention of instruments of measure. Um, and of course, this is not like a revolutionary idea, that, uh, the idea that the material world and its affordances has been registering ongoing kind of changes and that one can access the information that is held in materials. Um, Joel was using the word uh, forensics. Uh, yes, so there's lots of um, technical, uh, today technical probes that we can use to do this analysis. And like, uh, and he was also uh, delving into the world of bioacoustics and the ways in which Acoustic frequencies can register the um, can register diminished um, ecologies, things that even, I mean, in the case of bushfires, there's definitely a kind of visual absence. But of course, the acoustic uh, register um, can tell us about even in very um, in in forests that have undergone selective logging, there's a considerable dropout of certain insect frequencies. Things that we might not see in the visual realm are, are made possible through the kind of acoustic. But uh, these are these. I became really interested in the notion of data proxies um, when working on the atmospheric feedback loops project. And I'd like to play a two-minute clip from that, which will really um, go towards answering your question, Tim. Because, my, as I said, I was interested in data proxies. Uh, because it turns out that cultural materials are actually really important to helping build the global climate model. And so if you don't have, ins if you don't have data from uh, instrumentation, where do, you go where do you turn to find out something about um, temperature, something about atmospheric conditions? What would you look at? Well, you could look at things like um, 
shipping reports and farmers almanacs and um, but in particular you could also actually look at cultural materials and this um, this was the case with the scientists working in the Netherlands because of the fact that the Netherlands at a certain point was a real hotbed of like landscape painting and hundreds and hundreds of paintings were done by painters who weren't moving very far geographically, often like just uh, paint, you know, they were just developing paintings in their kind of local uh, rural villages. So you have this extraordinary bounty of Dutch landscape painting that was very uh, focused on um, documenting cloud formations. And so scientists in the Netherlands have been turning to these um, paintings to understand something about um, climactic conditions and using the visual records archived by paintings, using that data, translating that and plugging that into the global climate model, where it obviously has to be correlated against other kinds of um, other data sets. So it, nothing is evidential in and of itself. It always needs to be correlated or ground truth, another term that is used a lot. Um, but let me play that two minute clip because I think that will make, uh, that will be in some way also self-evident. Just play that. A story is repeated here at Cabau. The artist Joseph Boys once theorized that the unique atmospheric properties of light, which had inspired Dutch painters since the 17th century, had disappeared with the land reclamation projects of the 1950s. As post-war modernization began its terraforming operations throughout coastal regions of the Netherlands, the air was said to have lost its refractive shimmer due to the diminished number of water molecules carried inland by prevailing winds. We use a painting from the, the 17th century landscape painter Jacob van Ruisdaal. In fact, this is what he painted, the Dutch skies. Well, without knowing it, he uh, recorded all the complex things about uh, atmospheric research uh, that we're studying. The scientists conducting research here are recording even more dramatic changes as atmospheric feedback loops between land, sea, and air reveal long-term amplification of climate change signals. Terrestrial, aquatic, and atmospheric mediums have been forcefully remixed, creating radical new forms of unnatural media. So just to, um, so that's one way in which I think cultural materials, and they could be artworks, it could be works of literature, they, they can actually play a very kind of useful role. And, you know, like, so I found it like, I might never have thought about these paintings, but now there's also, uh, in some way, there's a ways in which the a certain kind of contemporary demand um, forces a sort of re-looking at something and you look again and uh, other things sort of come to the fore. So I found that re always really interesting, the sort of looking again at historic materials for with uh, a different kind of objective. And so that's one very, I think, pragmatic ways in which we can think about sort of cultural materials or artworks as um, mm. furnishing uh, evidence that can be incredibly kind of important and I say this also because oftentimes, you know, there isn't always uh, 
an image of an event that's, you know, where do you find evidence for events? Sometimes you have to find those in very distributed kinds of, um, you know, ways or, you know, Joel, you were talking about these shells and like the whole history of that, those structures and the history of extractivism in relationship to a colonial project, you can start to uncover that by tracking through the material, um, yeah, the, the material properties of that building. That building is, is not just a carrier of a certain kind of architectural history, but a history in relationship to land, to people, to processes of extractivism. And uh, there's something about the ways in which are kind of looking again into the kind of into materials, whether those are cultural materials or uh, geological materials or et cetera, et cetera, really can help us understand the, uh, you know, like help us to sort of answer that question in what world does, does something like this exist and to unfold that world in which certain entities exist, you know, and how did this building uh, come about what did it what was required for this building to actually emerge you know and then you start to un unfold that and it takes you into a, a whole set of like um a whole set of different kind of like realms of experience and histories etc and I so to, so to me in some that's also the ways in which I try to um yeah think about the ways in which Art can help. Um, sometimes, I, sorry, now I've <laughs> lost my train of thought. But um, I'm not, you know, in some way, I think the obvious answer to your question, and I'll wrap up here and turn over to Joel. But it's just to say that, you know, artworks are fairly effective um, in exposing injustice. There's lots of uh, fantastic examples of artworks, you know, actually. Uh, providing representations or accounts or documentary materials in relationship to injustice. What art is, you know, what art can't perhaps do is produce the transformative politics, can't really undo structural kind of racism. And so I think this is, but this is if we're expecting art to do that through the sort of, I guess, realm of uh, representation, but I think we can also work with our own cultural materials differently, not just in terms of like providing evidence through the like, through like representing wrongs and trying to right wrongs through some sort of representational kind of register, but also looking at the ways in which cultural materials are themselves um, part of really kind of like multi-perspectival and entangled kind of realities, I think might be one way that it could operate. Maybe I'll hand over to you, Joel. <laughs> No, thank you. That's so that's so great. I think um, I'm gonna kind of maybe try and dovetail into what you just said by talking um, specifically about a, a particular landscape painting and its painter. Um, so uh, I want to talk about Albert Namajira, who was an Aranda man um, who was born in a place now called um, Hermansburg, which is like a Lutheran mission in the central desert. Um, he looks over the McDonald's ranges, his Aranda country, which was Albert Namajira's country. And um, he was a trained, um, trained as a landscape painter um, by some white guy called Rex Fatterby. And there's a, you know, there's a there's that narrative. There's a narrative that sort of places him sort of under the tutelage of, um, of, a, of a sort of white um, English um, ex-military painter. Um, and that's not the one I'm particularly interested in. And what I, what I understand or what I feel like I understand um, Albert Namajira was doing and his family continue to do to this day by continuing to paint their country was he was intersecting with a very particular type of technology that was coming into contact with his, where he was. Um, and it's actually a very skillful manipulation of that technology, both being painting, but all, like in the landscape format, but also the art market that he attempted to dilute um, representation, representation that was defined by a white gaze of his, of his land, of his land. And, and there is something, you know, there, every, like he's 
he's famous for a reason. They're amazing paintings. And um, there's that contextual connection that is there, right? And, and, and I think there's more people who can talk to and kind of um, articulate the quality. I'm not an art critic, I'm not a art, art historian. I'm not gonna talk about what his paintings were doing um, visually. Um, but I want to talk about a particular narrative in relationship to a painting that he did called um, Twin Ghost, which is the painting of two ghost gums. Um, that painting um, was used by um, the local council there in 2012 and members of his family um, to make a, make a council native title claim against the council to mm -hmm. preserve that part of land. Um, and so his historical depiction, his depiction, the fact that those trees sustained in that place was used as evidence to take it into the sort of more legal and um, official frame. Um, the very unfortunate um, and very and very like unsurprising reality of, of, of that happening um, in the Australian context, especially in the context of the Northern Territory or what is now the Northern Territory on, in, in the Arunda country is that um, over the, the court hearing in which the decision was being made was adjourned because it was over the December break, over the sort of Christmas New Year's break. And in that time, um, the people, whoever, there's not been anyone who's ever been ousted by this, um, but unfortunately those trees were burnt down. They were um, completely destroyed um, in arson, an attack. Um, thus extinguishing the claim um, that uh, anyone could make through that painting and therefore on that land. And I don't think I need to explain like exactly how important um, a piece of artwork was in that context in the fact that the only way that you could refute and extinguish those claims, which we all understand to be sustained since in time immemorial, is through the destruction um, of what is depicted in them. Um, I'm not the only person who's talked about this as well. Um, there's Warwick Thornton made work in the Adelaide Biennale in 2014 uh, um, about this. And so I've been sort of writing about this narrative and these relationships between these things. And Warwick actually took some of the, the charred embers and the charcoal from that tree and then took that to the Biennale and drew that landscape. So quite a, quite a profound artwork as well in and of itself. But, um, yeah, I think in talking back to the question, <laughs> um, how how that how does art um, in, engage with these things? I think um, I think yeah, it's 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 kind of can be plainly put when we think about how these cultural artifacts or cultural objects that um, aren't exactly uh, you know a photograph or or something that could be rendered so clearly as evidence can become distributed and and speak to um, these things. And I and I would claim that. Um, Namajira and his family um, have always understood this um, and that there is a very particular and very um, skillful engagement with an unequal system, um, literally, because, you know, Albert, Albert Namajira was not a citizen when he was painting these paintings, right? That's why he wasn't awarded, that's why he wasn't given his his copyright claim. That's why his family had to fight for the last 50 years for the retrocession of his copyright claim because he was not considered a citizen. So there's also this like engagement with this unequal system where um, a painting that you might do is worth more than your, than your life. Um, and a willful engagement with an unequal system to preserve um, what is the imagery of, of, of your place and the place that you have connection with that might, that might outlast you, right? That might, outla may, may, may outla might outlast um, any claim that you can make, um, but if you can find a way to engage in a system um, that is, you know, finding ways to financialize and, and, and circulate these objects, then something might sustain in, in, that, in that context. And I think that that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a narrative, I think, that is shared amongst many Indigenous cultural practitioners historically for hundreds of years, um, not just in the Australian context and just in Albert Namajira's context, I think. Um, the sort of engagement with an institution at that level um, and the sort of their understanding that well, maybe it's not even worth calling it art from that perspective, right? Like it's actually, it's, it's, it's much more and it, and, it can, and it can facilitate much more.
I think that's what I'll do. I think that's a, a nice point to maybe try to kind of draw these threads together and conclude. And I, um, I think um, so often we feel uh, the frustration as kind of practitioners and um, art historians within the art world of kind of it's, um, you know, uh, often one dimensionality and it's sort of um, sort of walled garden style kind of structures. Do, does our message get out? And I think um, often it doesn't, but then uh, when it does and when it's applied in different circumstances, um, in this example um, that Joel has just so kindly provided around um, Namajira's work and sort of um, native title. And um, of course, Susan um, in this discussion around, you know, um, Dutch uh, landscape painting and sort of its application for when data didn't exist for sort of atmospheric fluctuation and changing qualities of light. There are these intersections between art and between science and, um, and art coming um, to bear on and hopefully provide some justice um, it's they are powerful examples and I think kind of really um, you know expand to this topic. Um, I just wanted to thank so much um, both um, Joel Sherwood Spring and um, Susan Shukley for their contributions today to atmospheric evidence and um, thank you so much and um, look forward to the next long times content.